terrorism, in particular the brutality of Boko Haram against our people, the senseless killings, the destruction of property, the enslavement and sale of our people, especially girls, kidnapped and married off, the terrorization of villages are a threat to our collective safety, security and development. Africa remains to this day a land where most people in the civilized world just don't concern themselves with. A place where Ebola was just an inconvenience until it started to kill thousands and spread to the bigger cities and caught the attention of the media. It is also home to unthinkable atrocities committed every day against innocents who have no way to fight back. Killers who may one day spread their bloody wings to other countries. Terror that at times seems unchecked and unnoticed. Let's talk about making a change. A pleasure to welcome back to Midpoint, former Deputy Commanding General of the Pacific Command, retired U.S. Army Major General, and co-author of the book Endgame, the blueprint for victory in the war on terror, Major General Paul Vallely. Major General, it's a pleasure to see you again. Thank you, Ed. This is just disgusting, actually. It's the only word that comes to mind when I read things like this. It's appalling. Officials in Cameroon say that more than 500 wounded people were trapped in a town. They had Boko Haram on the run. They were burning mosques and churches. They were shooting people wantonly. It seems as if nothing can bring this under, uh, under control. But more importantly, Major General, it doesn't seem to get the world's attention. I'm just curious, from a terrorist standpoint, should we not be paying closer attention to this because it is part of that global war on terror, is it not? Well, it is, Ed, and uh, as we look at the spread of radical Islam in, in Africa, and, and like you said, uh, I mean, even Obola is sort of passed uh, historically now um, as far as the news, but uh, I don't understand the Nigerian armed forces uh, that we have helped and assisted with foreign aid for quite a long time, uh, and we can't seem to muster any kind of uh, support for them over there to track down and target the locations of the Boko Haram. Uh, they certainly can do that with good intelligence and targeting and take them out just like we can take out ISIS uh, in Syria and uh, northern Iraq if uh, we put the right strategy and tactics together. It's, it's just mind-boggling today. Ed. We can't seem to get ahead anywhere against this radical Islamic move. Uh, across the Middle East and in Africa. Do we perhaps need to stop kidding ourselves? You mentioned the Nigerian Armed Forces. When we look at people like this, countries like this, do we just need to throw up our hands and finally say they can't get the job done? They're not able, for whatever reason, whether it's resolve or physical, mental, whatever, they just can't get it done. It's a fool's errand to try and put it in their hands. Well, that, that's true uh, in many ways, uh, but look, look at the United States, Ed. We can't get it done either with our leadership, or I should say lack of leadership and lack of resolve and strategy. With our national security time, we can't get it together over in the Middle East and haven't been able to for quite some time. So here you take a very poor uh, African nation and then you take one of the world's superpowers and then you look at even the Western powers uh, that don't seem to be able to take action against uh, the radical spread of the caliphate and radical Islam. I mean, Angela Merkel and at least President Holland are trying to move forward with uh, some sense of leadership, as King Abdullah is uh, doing uh, in Jordan. Major General, I got about a minute left. We'll take a break, come back, and turn to other points in Europe sure. as well. But from your perspective, from your experience, what would you do? if you were in charge right now, if you had the military in your hand, what could we do in order to at least help in some way these people that are dying by the hundreds? Well, first of all, Ed, this is unconventional warfare, and we have to have our Special Operations Command, which is commanded by a four-star general out of Tampa with uh, other uh, generals in charge around the globe and some of our uh, command and control headquarters. And so I would give it uh, the job to the four-star and have him conduct all con unconventional air ground operations against all the targets that we can find where ISIS, Boko Haram, and others are located. We took out 
the Taliban and Al Qaeda in 34 days with 100 special operators and air power back in the fall of 2001. And we can do it again today, but we have to have the resolve to do it, Ed. I'm going to ask you to hold on. We're going to come back after break because you just said a couple of words in there that I want to focus on. It'll speak to our next subject as well. We're going to return to the more imminent threat, that of the ISIS killers and what President Obama has finally decided to do, perhaps too late, to fight the growing threat. And here are the words specifically that I think we need to talk about that the Major General spoke a few moments ago. He used the phrase unconventional air and ground. That is something that we don't hear enough of, at least we don't get it explained. Let's find out more about what that means, what the President's talking about, and what it all means for America and American forces. When Midpoint continues. Let's welcome back to Midpoint. Military analyst, retired U.S. Army Major General Paul Vallely. Major General, I want to get right to those words. You used the phrase unconventional air and ground. What exactly do you mean by that? How tough would it be to be unconventional? And not only that, I can only imagine how some people in government and certainly some Americans would not be too thrilled with what unconventional might mean. Well, let me explain a little bit, Ed. Uh, we have conventional warfare, which is the old way we fought wars uh, against uh, conventional forces. But here we have unconventional forces now, radical Islamist jihadis. That's why I've always said this has been an unconventional war. Now, we should never have put these big bases in the Middle East, but you use the Joint Strike Force operations, what I call the lily pad strategy, where we gather good intelligence, targeting and we use our special operators along with air power to conduct raids, uh, to conduct, uh, you know, perhaps uh, rescue operations. Uh, and the Special Operations Command has been structured since 1988 under President Reagan to do these kind of things. And they should be the Operational Command, the Special Operations Command out of Tampa, Florida, to conduct these operations worldwide and to work with King Abdullah. We do have a U.S and Jordanian uh, Special Operations Center, uh, Counterterrorism Center located in Jordan. And it's been there for, for quite a while now. But I would have my special operators be working there with King Abdullah right now, targeting every ISIS location, because we can find anything on the ground. We can target a vehicle and look at the license plate with the capability we have from a high-tech uh, intelligence gathering uh, system to include satellites, drones, fighters, uh, so on, intel people on the ground. Uh, that's the focus we need to defeat ISIS and this radical Islam, whether it be in Nigeria, whether it be in Yemen, uh, whether it be in Syria or uh, uh, Iraq. There's ways to do this, but we don't seem to have the right formula, the right strategy, and the White House will not listen to the special operations guys uh, in the Pentagon. Well, and with regard to some of that strategy, let me get to some of that strategy here. Did ISIS maybe pick on the wrong guy in King Abdullah and maybe pick on the right guy in King Abdullah? Because, and again, your opinion here, that maybe he's the guy that he's called the fourth most important Muslim leader in the world right now, that maybe he's the guy to galvanize the Muslim communities together and get them to actually fight ISIS? I think this could well happen, and you know, King Abdullah was ahead of the Jordanian Special Forces uh, back when uh, he was a colonel and a young uh, general officer, and he's been trained, uh, you know, at Sandhurst. So uh, Jordan has been a, a target, the next target for ISIS after they broke the barrier, the border down between Syria and Iraq. Their next attempt is to go to Jordan and then to Saudi Arabia. Now, once you tear those down, then you got the border of Israel. So this all has to come together, and I would encourage Israel to become a part of this. This is an effort that's got to be done jointly with uh, air ground operations, find those targets and eliminate it. This could be launched within the next 48 hours if we're serious about it. And I think King Abdullah will take the lead in this. you got to strike while the iron's hot if you have this, right? If Abdullah's in there and he's the one that's talking Absolutely. about earth-shattering consequences, everybody's got to get behind him right away. Absolutely. I'd bring the B-52s in from Diego Garcia. I would use uh, whatever bombers we have, fighters, uh, armed helicopters, uh, do everything we can, target them, take them out, and decimate them as soon as possible. Okay, I got that a, should be the mission. I got a little bit over a minute left. I want to make sure we get Ukraine okay. in here. John Kerry is overseas. 
He says, first of all, no plans to arm Ukraine now. The president later comes out and says, we'll decide soon whether to arm the Ukrainians. John McCain comes out and says, well, if you don't, we'll get a bill in there to send arms to Ukraine. This is an amazing little runaround that's going on here where one hand doesn't seem to know what the other's doing. Well, that's true. And you can see why our credibility, our lack of respect from any country now because of the rhetoric, the empty words coming out of the White House and the State Department. You have to take action. You have to look like a leader and then others will respect you. So that's not happening now. So the question is, what are the American people going to do? What's Congress going to do to get new leadership in and to get a new national security team that can protect America and work with our allies? I got about 30 seconds left. In your opinion, is the president going to screw it up again if he does not put lethal weapons in the hands of the people in Ukraine? Well, he, he's going to, and uh, you've got NATO over there, which should be coming together. Uh, at least you got France and Germany taking some action. But uh, I can see this just as empty, empty rhetoric again uh, by uh, the State Department carrying Obama in the White House. They're just a weak, inept team. And the question is, what are we going to do about it, America? Major General, I'll tell you what, there's nothing like, and I had this told to me a long time ago, nothing like on the other side when you see those B-52s coming your way. <laughs> That's right, exactly. It's, it's a frightening moment if you're on the ground and here they are uh, overhead. That is scary. There you go. Absolutely. Major General, okay. always a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much. We'll talk soon. All right. Take care. Thank you, Ed. Yeah, my pleasure. There are those who insist the Keystone Pipeline is the right thing for every American, but we'll talk with one American at ground zero of the debate who believes there is nothing right about the pipeline and it has really nothing to do with political aspirations. That and more right here on Midpoint where we question everything.